Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Steve Fiddick, who is a jazz drummer, composer, author, and educator. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bart. I appreciate the opportunity. Sure. You, uh, you're the expert here on uh, Joe Morello because you took lessons with him, um, right? And, and we're going to learn a lot about Joe today. Yeah, I, I had the good fortune of meeting and studying with Joe dating back to 1987. And, um, you know, it was an opportunity that really, really changed my life. Yeah, and I'm excited to learn about how that all came to be and what it did for you. But before we um, sort of get into that, you know, your lessons with Joe, let's talk a little bit about who Joe Morello is for someone who maybe doesn't know anything about him and they're just learning about him. So um, why don't you tell us who Joe Morello is? Well, Joe Morello is one of the most influential jazz drummers of his generation. Um, he's best known for his work with the Dave Brubeck Quartet, yep. which he joined in October of 1956. And he spent approximately 12 years with the quartet uh, through 1967. And he's on the um, famous recording Time Out, yep. which was yep. recorded in 1959. And um, he was the drummer on the, the very famous composition take five, hmm. which was a very unique um, composition. It was a, a drum solo feature written yeah. by Paul Desmond, the alto saxophonist in the group. And it was, um, it was a composition written for Joe specifically to end concerts with the Dave Brubeck quartet. Joe told me in lessons, that it was really a throwaway tune. Uh, it was a, it was a rhythm that Joe would work, work out on backstage before concerts in five, four time, wow. hence the name take five. So it was this yeah. rhythm that Joe had like kind of a warm up rhythm that he used on the drum pad. And, um, you know, he would pester Dave and, and Paul to write a tune based on this rhythm to feature himself. And, um, Paul finally came up with two themes, which became the A section and then the bridge of the tune. And yeah. um, it's, a unique, it's a unique drum solo because it's the first drum solo in jazz history that's accompanied. Yeah. It's accompanied by a piano vamp. Wow, that's so cool. And so it was really about, it was a solo that had less to do about technical speed and had a lot more to do with space and phrasing yeah, and tiny. playing over the bar. Yeah. Yeah. And now today, when you hear jazz recordings today, modern jazz, many of the drum solos that you'll hear on recordings are accompanied by vamps. Sure. Bass vamps, guitar, bass vamps, piano, guitar, bass vamps, horn vamps. It just gives the drummer more freedom to create space and play musically as opposed to like buddy rich or someone where it would be like, you know, a horn slide and then everyone's out until buddy or until Gene goes da 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 on his cowbell and everyone comes back in. Yeah. Drum solos before take five were really technical displays. Sure. And, uh, but really the end result was the same. I mean, Joe would bring the house down with, with the, with the drum solo on take five. And, and it was always the piece that they used to end concerts, the Dave Brubeck Quartet. They would start concerts with St. Louis Blues and they would end concerts with, with uh, take five. That makes sense. Now, while we're on take five, do you know if, and the answer is probably no, did he get, you know how sometimes like a band will be like, their big, big, big hit, they'll get so tired of playing it and not want to play it anymore. Did he ever get sick of playing take five that you know of? Uh, I wouldn't say sick of it, but it certainly gave him his identity, of course. Sure. And, um, but other drummers, older drummers, uh, would kid with him. For example, um, Gene Krupa would say, okay, kid, you're sort of stuck with take five now, <laughs> like I am with sing, sing, sing. Exactly. And they became very, very close friends at the end of Gene Krupa's life. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, the last five years of Gene's life, he wanted, Joe told me this in a lesson, he wanted to get his hands back in shape. He wanted to get his technique back up to the point where it once was. You know, he was getting older. Yeah. He wasn't playing maybe quite as much, I presume. But um, so he started taking lessons with Joe. And, mm. and uh, Joe's wife, Jean, would drive Joe over to Jean's house in Yonkers, New York, and yeah. um, every Sunday for quite some time. And they would work out on the drum pad wow. and, and, um, and hang out. And they would spend That's their so Sunday cool. afternoons together that way. Such legends, you know, such players. And you, you said, let's just also maybe take a side note here. You said uh, Joe's wife, Jean, his, her name is Jean, right? Yes. So, um, married, Jean June, married June 2nd, 1966. Okay, wow. He, um, Joe has very poor vision. So that explains kind of why he would need to be driven. He's sort of famous for his um glasses <laughs> you know in in a way people could go you see a video and, or you look at him on the stage and you see him from 100 feet away and he's the guy with the glasses it looks more like a chemist you know i know they're thick so he, but he wasn't he became basically blind he, right he was legally blind from okay now i don't know exactly when uh the doctors determined that he was legally blind, but from the time he was born throughout his life, he had approximately 38 operations on his eyes. Oh God, poor guy. And so he couldn't, you know, partake in the daily types of fun type of routines that most young children would have the opportunity to do, like go out and play basketball or be a part of little league or or anything yeah. like that. So to help give him confidence as a young man, from the time he was very, very young, his mother began teaching him piano. Mm. Um, so he was born in Springfield, Massachusetts, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, 1928, July 17th. And uh, his father was a painting contractor. And his his mom would teach him first exposed him to music through the piano. And then um, at age five, his parents bought him a violin and he began to take lessons on the violin. And um, he continued to play violin. And three years after working on violin and taking lessons, he was a featured soloist with the Boston Symphony Orchestra performing oh the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. God, wow. And at age 12, he made a second appearance with the orchestra and at that appearance, he met his idol, the great Yasha Heifetz. Hmm. And after hearing Yasha Heifetz play the violin in person, he felt he couldn't achieve that same quality and intensity <laughs> sure. of sound. So he decided to change course at age 15 and became interested in the drums. Oh, man. I had no idea. He was a violinist, started as a pianist, then went yeah. to violin and... Did he, did you ever know, did, 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 did he, you know, for fun, play the violin throughout his life or did he just kind of drop it? I've never, I never saw him play any violin or when I was at his home, I never, I never saw a violin at his house. Interesting. Um, but many of his students, uh, friends and colleagues of mine, we would, we would talk from time to time and we all agree that his finger control with drumsticks in the left hand because when you hold a violin of course you're you're controlling the yeah. pitches and the intonation with your left hand in part yep. um that that type of finger control and dexterity in part is a byproduct of his studies on violin from a very young age he had he already had that fine-tuned uh, finger motion that he used yeah. quite effectively with his yeah. left hand, because that's that's really what he was known for when he was. Oh my God! As a, it's, from a technical standpoint, which I don't think he would. Uh, he he really didn't want to be known as a technician. He was really more so concerned with sounding great with a band. Yeah, but he sure. also wanted people to know that he worked really, really hard at this. He worked very, very hard. He was a hard practicer. 
very humble man. He practiced every day. He held the sticks in his hands every day. Hmm. He, he had to feel that wood in his hands. Louis Belson mm -hmm. was the same way. Louis Belson told me that. That each day they had to practice. They had to just feel the sticks in their hands moving and working for them. And um, so, but he knew how to use that technique in a very musical way. Yeah. In a very, very musical way. He never exploited it. He used it. He said it was always, it was always great to have more technique than I actually needed for the gig. Um, especially when it came time to being featured as a, as a drum soloist with the groups I worked with because it gave yeah. me an abundance of confidence so that when I, when I had to solo, I felt like I had the confidence and the ideas to express myself because of the technique. Right before you even just said the confidence, it kind of was going through my mind of like, it's like a quiet confidence of like, he knows he's not just... I Buddy Rich always gets used as an example for a number of things, but Buddy Rich might be considered a loud confidence <laughs> as opposed to Joe, which is like more of like a, he knows he has it. He's very kind of like, like you said, he's, he's the drummer in a band as opposed to a technician, but, but he really does have those technical skills. Um, let's move through his drumming background then a little more. So you said it at 15, mm -hmm. he switched to the drum set um, did he perform, did he play with school or did he just kind of start playing with other musicians in his, in Massachusetts or how, how did the rest of that go? Well, he had some really, some really close childhood friends in Springfield, Massachusetts that went on to have some incredible, had incredible careers of their own, like, uh, Sal Salvador, mm -hmm. who's a great, great jazz guitarist who, who went on to play with the Stan Kenton orchestra bassist. Chuck Andrus, who played with um, Woody Herman swinging her to the early 1960s with Jake Hanna on drums, um, and also Phil Woods, uh, bebop alto saxophone legend Phil Woods. All of these mm -hmm. gentlemen were very good friends with Joe um, at a very young age. You know, they were childhood buddies, so they would they would get together, and and they would just have jam sessions together. So when Joe switched to the drums. He would hang out with his buddies and, and they would play together. Um, he also had a, a drum teacher once he transitioned from violin to, uh, to drums, it's just snare drum. And, um, that, that person was named Joe, Joe Sefchik, And he was a, a mm. show drummer, a show drummer in Springfield, Massachusetts. And he, he provided Joe with basic fundamentals and, and encouraged him, gave him some confidence. And, um, Joe began gigging around the Springfield area. Each week he would go to the theater where Joe Sefcik would be performing and sit right in the front row to check out his setup, his trappings, and, and all the different beats that Joe Sefcik would be playing. Yeah. Which is, it's just interesting too. So he was born tw in 28, which is basically, you know, after the year of the big, the talkies, the death of the trap drummer. Mm -hmm. So he was born right as a pretty major transition was going on in the world of drumming, um, which is just an interesting side note. Yeah. And, and it's, it's amazing to think that he changed course like that, that he had the confidence to change course like that. Yeah. And most people think of Joe as one of the great technical players along with Buddy Rich, a different yes. tap sound, a different, uh, a different, intensity perhaps mm -hmm. but but certainly in that same realm of, of technical facility with buddy yeah. yeah um but uh you know again he he used his his technique in a very in a very musical way yeah I, i'd say to put it very you know simply his left hand he just he flies i mean he it is just speed and control and cleanliness and just him as a person with the glasses and the suit and, you know, kind of a tight haircut. He, he's just, a, he's just a cool, it's a, it's a cool looking image with this flying drum solo with this kind of well-dressed guy. It's, it's a, he's got the whole package there. Well, it's interesting because the Brubeck quartet, they had uniforms, you know, <laughs> so they always wore the same, the same suit and the, white shirt and the tie, the long tie. Yeah. And, um, 
you know, they traveled awesome. nine months out of the year. Oh, and sure. uh, with the group, Joe went around the world four times with that group. Hmm. Um, and, um, but he always told me in lessons, you know, he was always more concerned with sound rather than speed. And most students would come to him and want to learn how to play fast. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, he was more concerned with sound. And I think that leads back to, um, the time where he first heard Yasha Heifetz when he was playing violin hmm. with the Boston Symphony Orchestra, where sure, he, he yeah. just realized I can't attain that sound, so I want to I want to make my own course with a different instrument. Gosh, that's such a big jump! It's not like he went from violin to you know I'm not going to achieve that. I'm going to play the cello. Yeah, <laughs> it's like going. Yeah. I'm going to just, it's apples and oranges. It's such a big jump, but it, it obviously worked out. Um, well, one of his, one of his most famous students, uh, the original drummer in the Pat Metheny group, Danny Gottlieb. Yeah. You know, he got his start on cello. Oh, wow. So he, he first, he first played cello and then, um, switched to drums. I think he started playing drums around 1968 and started studying with Joe in 1969. Wow. So, and again, Danny has incredible technique as well. Very, very fast reflexes and, and great finger technique too. So that could be, there could be something there with, with, uh, learning, you know, learning a string instrument and having that technical facility with your fingers, this finger strength, dexterity hmm. control. Yeah. I've heard a lot about Danny from, uh, from I'm, I'm taking lessons right now. People who listen to the show know that I've, I've been taking lessons with Barry James, who was a, um, student of, uh, George Lawrence Stone, um, and he was telling me a lot about how Danny's just the, uh, you know, a great, you know, drummer and very, very, very great student. Let's on that note, good transition. Let's talk about maybe, um, I'm assuming it kind of, cause it predates the Brubeck days. I think let's talk about how we got into lessons with the great George Lawrence Stone, uh, the author of Stick Control and um, Accents and Rebounds. So let's, how, how did that happen? Well, he studied with Joe Sefcik for a period of time. And yeah, sure. my understanding with, that Joe Sefcik was a real disciplinarian, a real taskmaster um, from interviews that I've read. Um, but he took Joe so far, and um, he also sounded like a humble man in, in uh, the interviews that I read about about Joe Sefcik, and he recommended mm -hmm. that that Joe study with with George Lawrence Stone, go study with Stone, and um, so Joe would would travel by bus from Springfield, Massachusetts, to to Boston to take lessons with Stone. And when uh, when Joe started to take lessons, he really wanted to be a legitimate percussionist. Mm. You know, he wanted to be a member of a, a symphony orchestra on percussion. That was his goal. So he started taking uh, orchestral snare drum lessons with Stone and became very interested and naturally curious. He wanted to move on to um, timpani and xylophone, and Stone refused to teach him th those instruments because of his impaired vision. Really? Yeah. So Wh Why? Just because the... the well, he would have a very difficult time reading xylophone yeah. music and timpani music because the music stand is placed so far in front of both of those instruments. Plus, as an orchestral percussion instrument, you know, as a percussionist in an orchestra, you're in the back row, and you also need yeah. to, you need to follow the conductor, and and so that distance also played into it. So he wow. he really um, he really discouraged Joe from from going down that path. Um, and, and actually encouraged trap set, you know, and, and, jo and Joe had some experience on drum set, just jamming with his, with his friends, you know, um, like, like we talked about a moment ago. Sure. Um, but he, he never wanted to pursue that seriously. He really did. He wanted to be a legitimate classical percussionist, but it was stone that, um, that encouraged him to follow the same path as, Stone's former student, Gene Krupa, and pursued the pursued jazz drums. Wow. Now, 
you just said something that I'm like, wow, I never thought about that. So the fact that his his impaired vision and reading music, mm-hmm. you kind of take that for granted. And I actually, so working as an audio engineer, I've recorded and worked with a guy who's a um, extremely nice guy, great singer, but he is, sounds like Joe, he's very, 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 I don't think, he's not considered blind. I mean, he pretty much is. He can't drive. He can see about... Um, two inches away from his face. Like he'll, he'll hold his phone up very close to kind of read stuff. But um, I was recording him cause he's working on, he's, he likes to sing and um, he had to print like size 72 font, wow. put it about, and then have, I had the music stand about literally three inches from his face and that's how we would do it. And um, just makes me think of, with Joe, like how would you work on, let's say stick control or something like that? I guess he would have to just bring the book pretty close to his face. And I know it progressively got worse, his vision, but, um, and, and he was able to read even when he made the transition in to New York city. I mean, he was, he was taking gigs that required him to read. He, he did jingle work. He did some studio work. He recorded several records where reading was a prerequisite. So he was mm-hmm. able to read. But when you're playing drum set and you're reading, you can keep that music stand closer to your to your left side, closer to the hi hat, or closer to the floor tom. So you're not you're not reading at such a far distance. I mean, some yeah. drummers put the music stand in front of the bass drum, you know, so that they can follow the conductor. But uh, I mean, most drummers will hold you know have the music either to the left or to the right. He really couldn't see all that well to you know, and I think Stone knew that as Joe continued on his journey through life, that his, his eyesight would continue to get worse. So he just, he just thought, well, why not, why not see if um, we can use this opportunity to change his course once again? So, you know, he changes his course from, from violin to drums and he figures, well, I love classical music, obviously, because he's playing violin. I'll, yeah. I'll go to this great classical percussionist, George Lawrence Stone, and I'll become a classical percussionist. Um, hmm. And uh, he was really hurt that Stone said that. He told me that. He was really hurt by that because he wanted to, he really had his eyes set on that, being a legitimate percussionist. And uh, hmm. But, you know, yeah. w- with his studies with Stone, um, you know, Stone really helped him with um, developing his reflex um, developing his sound, natural body motion, the level system, allowing the sticks to work for you, allowing the stick sure. to do the work, allowing you, you know your body to accept the natural rebound, um, and that and all of that was through you know the pillar of percussion, really, where we all begin our studies in percussion, which is stick yeah. control. And Joe was again a, a naturally curious, hardworking, disciplined person. So he would take those exercises in stick control. And if you go through the whole book, you'll notice that you won't find a single accent in that book. Um, yeah, yeah. It's 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 sticking patterns for control and for endurance. If you repeat each line twenty times, um, it's also a book that will help you develop your single stroke roll, your double stroke roll and your closed roll, and then there's a section on flams. So, um, but really the foundation of the book is the first three pages, pages five, six, and seven. Yeah. And so what Joe would do is he would, he would practice, diligently practice the exercises that Stone gave him. Um, but then when he took them home, he practiced them, but he also experimented with them and added accents, different accent patterns, with the stickings that were written just to vary it up a little bit. Sure. And he would bring those, those patterns back to stone to show him what he did with the lesson material. And stone was always very knocked out and encouraged, encouraged Joe to continue to do, uh, these types of patterns and continue to experiment with these types of patterns and, and stone would write them down. And, um, these patterns, eventually became Stone's second book, which he dedicated to Joe. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Accents and Rebounds. Yeah. So Joe would refer to Stick Control as Stick Control, Accents and Rebounds, and then Joe's first technical method book, um, Master Studies, 
he would mm-hmm. refer to those three books as the trilogy. Whereas That's you'd go through stick yeah. control and then accents and rebounds and master studies was an extension of both stick control and, and accents and rebounds. Wow. Um, hmm. Interesting. I've heard so many good things about uh, George Lawrence Stone, about him being kind of open to evolving and changing and not um, and just being a very nice guy who would, um, you know, be happy that people are taking his things and growing and um, just in the big picture was Joe. I mean, in your experience with taking lessons, which we'll we'll get there. But um, was he a really serious guy? Was he a funny guy? Was he a nice guy? What was he, he like as a person? He was, he, I, the best way I could describe him, he was an individual. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a very individual approach. He would say, this isn't for everybody. Um, I think he, in his own way, you had to prove to him that you really wanted it. And, and I'll mm-hmm. give you an example. The first lesson that I took with Joe was from 5 to 7 p.m., it was a two hour lesson because I lived approximately three hours from oh, the drum studio. So my, my father drove me to uh, Glenn Weber's drum shop in, uh, West orange, New Jersey and, hmm. uh, got there early, you know? So I got there around four thirty, and lesson was supposed to start at five. Joe wasn't there yet. Five thirty. Joe oh. wasn't there yet. Six o'clock. I'm so, my father was like, where is he? Did you book this lesson or not? <laughs> <clears throat> and I'm like, yeah. So I asked Glenn Weber, who, who um, was running, runs the shop, owns the shop. Um, where's Joe? And he said, well, this is completely normal. He said, no, I'll give him a call just to make sure that he's feeling okay and that he's still coming in. Huh. And uh, his wife answered and said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm bringing him over now. So the five to seven lesson started at seven. Oh and went God. to nine your dad's like what the hell yeah so like from then on i drove myself but my father <laughs> wanted to meet him because he was a fan of the dave rubeck quartet uh, and, but he uh, he's a legend he can get away with it normally yeah. though if it was just some teacher at like a music store you'd be like dude right <laughs> two and, hours and, late and so i quickly learned you know i'll go to pick you up at your house and and we uh, can and we could you know start the lesson or if, if, or if he felt like he wanted to have lunch before the lesson, we could do that. Or yeah, if I was his only lesson, we would, I would pick him up. We would take the lesson and then have dinner afterwards. Man, that's cool. So it was like a two hour lesson, but when you factored in the time hanging out, either having lunch or dinner, it was a six to eight hour day together. <laughs> that's really cool though. I mean, so there was this mentoring that, yeah. that takes place one-on-one and it's something that is very very rare um in today's teaching environment where you have online obviously with with covid um you know everything is online nothing's in person but even even so before uh this pandemic hit you know if you had a lesson it started at a certain time and it ended at a certain time yeah and um there wasn't this uh, apprenticeship, no. Uh, which which I fe- which I really felt like um, I had uh, under him, under Joe, under his tutelage, where I could call him anytime and ask him questions about the lesson material. He always took my call. He always answered my questions. He would actually get upset if I if I wouldn't call and check in. If his students wouldn't call and check in, he would he would give you a hard time when you finally did. Yeah, he wanted to hear from his students. He he really he never had children of his own, so he wanted. He really looked at his his students as his children, and and he had some he had some incredible students in all facets of percussion. You know, I'm mm. thinking of you know we mentioned Danny Gottlieb, um, John Riley, yeah, who teaches at the Manhattan School of Music and is the drummer with the Vanguard Orchestra. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, Tim Genus of the Boston Symphony, Symphony Orchestra timpanist. He studied with him. Hmm. Lee Howard Stevens credits Joe. When Lee Howard Stevens was a student at Eastman School of Music, he would come to Joe and take snare drum and drum set lessons with Joe and credits those lessons in part 
to his method of movement method the, where he holds the four the four mallet technique that he uses on on marimba you know he would always say you know you could use this technique that i'm going to show you in any type of musical situation you know yeah it knows no style it has no bounds you can take this and use it in any way you want sure now and I, I always think it's interesting just to kind of paint the picture of, of what it was like then. Was Joe just like a pretty affordable um, price for a lesson to go to the shop and, and, and learn with him? Yeah, I mean, I thought so. When I, when I started studying with Joe, it was $35 an hour. That's so awesome. <laughs> that's, and, that's and I mean, I don't great. know what it, that is with inflation today, but it's still... That's not you know, much. I, I, think it's pretty, I think it's pretty reasonable for for, you know, for the amount of attention that I received and, um, and the amount of hours we would hang out. So yeah, the lessons were very structured. You know, we spent an hour on the drum pad and an hour on the drums hmm. and he allowed you to record the lessons. So, you know, I have over 20 hours of video, um, wow. of, of, of those lessons. And, um, and then when we hung out afterwards, then it was, you know, stories from the road and, and just things to look out for in the music business as, you know, I would go down my, my journey if I come in for a lesson and I had some questions about musicians or leaders, dealing sure. with leaders or, you know, working with bass players or just, you know, musical situations yeah. that I was finding myself in or having trouble or difficulty with. That's the mentorship, basically. I mean, yeah. that's the, Yeah. Man, uh, his wife must have been pretty understanding. Because I think of like, you know, I go to like a band practice for two hours or I go and like, like record these episodes for like two hours. And I usually get a text from my wife being like, all right, are you almost done? <laughs> but she, with Joe, it's like these six hour uh, hangs. Well, you know, she, um, Jean, and she's still yeah. with us. You know, I spoke with her yesterday. I gave her a call just to check in, see how she was wow. doing. And um, they were 10 years apart. You know, Jean was 10 years younger. And, um, just the sweetest, sweetest lady. She booked all the lessons and um, just such a deep, you know, as you can imagine, just a deep love for him and uh, admiration as, as we all have for him. Um, he was the first person I was ever around that was, really was a true artist. You know, he did mm -hmm. things on his terms. He, ne he never really... Um, he didn't change the way he did things to please anybody. He would always say that's the secret to failure is to try to please everyone. Yeah. The secret, you know, that's the secret to failure. The secret to success is to please yourself and do what's right. Follow the straight line. Yeah. Follow the straight line. You know what's right. Follow your gut. Yeah. Boy, that's a true, uh, that's some good advice right there. And, um, you know, he, you know, he, I mentioned he was an individual. I mean, he had his influences. He loved Gene. He loved Gene Krupa's playing. He mm -hmm. felt every note he played had purpose. He loved Buddy Rich. He thought Buddy's power with the Tommy Dorsey band was just unbelievable. Probably his, sure. his first two influences. Um, his first two major influences on the drums when he was studying with Stone. Um, Sefcik was the one who who told him about Gene Krupa. He never heard of Gene Krupa until he started studying with Joe Sefcik. Um, hmm. He also talked about Sid Catlett and Shadow Wilson. Yeah. He liked the way they moved, their fluidity and their legato approach. Um, he talked about Kenny Clark. He loved Kenny Clark's ride cymbal beat. He liked the spread of the beat, the sound of the ride cymbal. Kenny Clark had a really elegant ride cymbal beat. So if you listen to Joe uh, on those great Dave Brubeck recordings, and even before that, the recordings with Mary McPartland, and there's, there's several recordings that, if we have time, I, I'd like to mention uh, yeah. that when he was with Mary McPartland from 1953 to 1956, he was also recording with other artists. And those, and those recordings are, are fairly hard to find and, and somewhat rare. But I think they're interesting to hear because this was a three or four year period where everything was new to Joe. 
I mean, when he moved to New York, he was living at the YMCA. Oh, wow. And, you know, he was struggling. He gave himself six months. He told his father, I'm going to give myself six months. If I can't do this, I'm going to move back to Springfield. You know, his father was a real taskmaster. His mom was really soft, but his mom passed when he was 17. Mm, boy. So I think there was always that I need to please my father in him. You know, that I got to prove yeah, to my definitely. dad that I've got to get this. I got to do this. You know, which I relate to in some, in some form or fashion. My father was, was a disciplinarian and um, a real uh, detail-oriented man. I mean, he worked at sure. top chewing gum. You know, he was a, a tool and die guy that made the, the, the parts to keep the machinery working, wrapping the bazooka bubble gum and cutting the baseball oh. cards and the ring pops. And he wow. was a musician too on the side. He played six nights a week in the 60s on tenor saxophone. And that's where I wow. got my start playing with his groups. Man, that's so but cool. He yeah, was what an interesting very, job. He was a disciplinarian, my dad. So, I mean, I always wanted to please my dad. You know, I wanted to make sure yeah. that he knew I could do this. I can play for a living. You know, you know. You, yeah, of course. You put your mind to it. You could, you could uh, do whatever. You, you put your mind to it if you work hard enough. And yeah. um, so, those three or four years were really uh, a real fruitful period that led to the gig with the Dave Brubeck Quartet. So, listening to Joe develop on those recordings. And Blossom, I think, is really an interesting period of time that is an overlooked period of time in jazz history because everyone goes to those Brubeck recordings and why not? They're just, they're brilliant. Yeah. You know, they're brilliant recordings. Joe's favorite of all of the recordings he did with Dave was um, the Carnegie Hall concert. Uh, hmm. it's, a two, it's a two CD set on Columbia, live recording from uh, Carnegie Hall. And Joe had 102 fever. They just got back, I think, from Europe and um, didn't feel much like playing. Almost didn't do the concert. You know, he was just so sick. And, uh, but when he took the stage, everything was fine. You know, he broke a sweat and everything was fine. Yeah. Gosh. Um, Man. I think, um, so I just was looking it up a little bit because I was like, how old would, so doing the math, during the 40s, during World War II, Joe would have been too young to be, because I was thinking maybe he got, you know, his vision would have kept him out, but he was too young to go, obviously, into wa the war, which a lot of people at that point did. I mean, Elvis, everyone was like involved with it. But it's interesting. It looks like Dave Brubeck was actually in the army during World War II, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, just kind of, you know, reading a little bit br really quickly. It's like, it seems like he didn't, he wasn't uh, faced with too much, um, you know, on the front line, but, uh, but Joe would have been, it's, if I do the math kind of, Joe would have been, you know, under 18 for most of the war so that he wouldn't have been involved in that. With the, with the exception of, or with the added wrinkle, I should say of that there still was a draft going on. Yeah. And so a lot of musicians because of the draft during a war period of time would enlist or audition for a band. And then if they made a band, um, then would enlist in the military. You know, I'm okay. thinking of Steve Gadd, for example, during the Vietnam war, um, you know, after he graduated from Eastman school of music, yes, he came down to the DC area and, and auditioned for the Marine band. And then auditioned for the Army Field Band and won that job at the Army Field Band and then enlisted into the Army and hmm. stayed stateside performing concerts around the U.S. with the Army Field Band and um, did three years, three-year enlistment, fulfilled his obligation to the military. And um, so he didn't con concern himself with the draft because he enlisted. And yeah, oddly enough, true. you mentioned Joe. He, he actually enlisted into the Massachusetts State Guard because he wanted to play, he wanted to play music. And um, when he enlisted, he was in and they, they figured out that he had vision problems. So he had to, uh, he had to be discharged, but he did enlist actually into oh, the wow. State Guard. Okay. This was before it was a National Guard. Yeah, man, that's interesting. It, 
totally unrelated from drums, but there's just always, you find out those interesting things. Like I was working on, still am working on an episode about the drummers who would be on the Johnny Carson show and, you know, Buddy Rich and Johnny playing it, being a drummer. And I, I found out that uh, Ed McMahon was in the Air Force and flew, I think it says 85 combat missions and was just like a real deal wow. dude in the Air Force. So you just hear about these people who have these lives. It's just so interesting to think of like Dave Brubeck, you know, being in, you know, in Europe during the war and then he comes back. And that's when in, in, you know, in me being a 30 year old guy, I think of, you know, take five, you forget about these guys in this time having this totally different. It's incredible. Life. Yeah. Very incredible. It really is. But yeah. Okay. So then, um, 56 to 67, that's the Brubeck era when that really is what puts Joe in the public eye. Is that safe to say? Well, before he was with Dave Brubeck for three years, he was a member of the Marion McPartland trio. Mm -hmm. So that was mm -hmm. one of the very first long running gigs he had Got when it. he, when he first moved, when he first moved to New York, his childhood friends, Sal Salvador and Phil Woods were already in New York and they encouraged and pushed him to come. Okay. Um, he was traveling with Hank Garland, who was a guitarist, um, Hank Garland of the Grand Old Opry. So he was, um, a country guitarist. He was in Nashville from, I think he got to Nashville in the mid forties and uh, had a recording contract with Decca records in the late 1940s. And he was friends. Uh, Hank Garland was friends with Ralph Caputo, who was an, he played accordion and he's from the Springfield area and he was family friends with Joe Morello's family. So Joe knew Ralph and I think that's how that connection with Hank Garland came about. Got it. With, wow. with Joe. So Joe played with Hank Garland and um, eventually with Glenn Gray and did some traveling with, with Glenn Gray before moving to New York City in 1952. And when he first came to New York, uh, drummers Mousy Alexander and uh, Don Lamont. Mousy Alexander was working with Marion McPartland at the time. Hmm. And before that, Don Lamond was working with Marion McPartland, and he also played with Woody Herman, Second Herd, great big band drummer, amazing yeah. drummer. Joe loved Don Lamond's playing. Um, he's the yeah. drummer on Beyond the Sea. Um, those great drum breaks on that. Um, yeah, got and, Mousy Alexander. Talk about a that's a I'm not familiar with them. That's a great jazz name. I just love some of the old uh, yeah <laughs> jazz names. Yeah, you know. So he 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 met him and. Uh, they both were very encouraging to Joe and they both introduced Joe to, um, to Marion and Joe started jobbing around a little bit in New York, you know, with guitarist Johnny Smith. Then he subbed for Stan Levy for a few weeks with the Stan Kenton band. Uh, he loved big band. Joe loved big band really at his core. He was a straight ahead swing drummer. He loved straight ahead swing, even though he's known for, playing complicated odd time signatures and making them feel comfortable really at his core he loved swing down the middle straight ahead and kicking a big band with all its brass um so he did that for a few weeks and then that experience led to uh this engagement with Mary McPartland who had um a steady at the Hickory House so six mm -hmm. nights a week at the Hickory House which is nice. this very very famous very very famous jazz club in New York at the time and when he was with Marion, he spent three years with her and they were, they were a very popular trio with Bill Crow on the bass. And, um, a lot of musicians were starting to come into town and, or come into the club to hear him play with, um, with Marion. It was, it was a very, very hot group. Um, he started to win some polls like the downbeat, uh, young jazz musician on the rise pole. Um, and uh, he had some offers from Benny Goodman. He had an offer from Tommy Dorsey, which he turned down to stay with Marion McPartland because he was doing so well. He was playing six nights a week with her, but then he was recording during the day um, with, with many artists. And uh, those are some of the records that maybe if we have time, we can talk about yeah. um, for your listeners to check out. But Paul sure. Desmond and Dave Brubeck also came in to hear 
your Joe oh, nice. play with Marion, and they really liked his brushwork. And at the time, Dave was on the cover of Time magazine um, around that same period of time. And Dave wanted to make a change in his group. He wanted to um, explore different time signatures and, um, and, and be, you know, continue to fuse classical elements with jazz, uh, which he's known for, Dave yeah. Burick. But, um, hmm. And Joe cool. was reluctant at first. He, he wasn't... Uh, he wasn't that keen on on the Day Brubeck Quartet, really, because the drummer at the time, his name was Joe Dodge, and he said, you know, you he said, you don't feature your drummer. You know, he's in the background, he plays brushes the entire time. You know, yeah. the group the group fe is featuring Paul Desmond on alto saxophone. I mean, even the early recording said the Day Brubeck Quartet featuring Paul Desmond. And so he said, If I if I came with your group, I would like to be featured. And and Dave guaranteed that he would be and <laughs> that's uh, nice and so joe gave it a shot he said um you know they joined he joined the group in october of 1956 dave wanted him to sign a contract but he wasn't really interested in signing anything because he didn't want to be locked in you know he told dave he said you know i may not like traveling as much as you do you may not like my playing and so why don't we just try it and see how things work out Man. And uh, he, he plays as uh, he he controls everything. That's that's pretty cool. He's 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 in demand. Yeah, and and he had a way though. It wasn't, you know, he had a, he he just had a natural sense about him, where he can he can read a situation, yeah, you know, like a certain sixth sense about him, where he could get things done the way he envisioned them without being heavy-handed yeah or pushy yeah or never something. never never saw him raise cool. his temper ever oh, yeah yeah that's and a good had, skill and, and he would do this though he would no matter what whether it was in a lesson or with his the musicians in his own group or with with Brubeck or when he was with Mary McPartland stories he told he just had a way of being soft-spoken um and it, he would interpret the environment that he was in at the moment and he had that feeling. He could just feel if, if it was going to be a heavy, dark environment or, or something that was, was somewhat more enjoyable, perhaps. Um, even, even when we would go out and eat at a restaurant, he knew how to, he knew how to speak to a waiter, the <laughs> waitress, the bartender. He knew how to get the best out of people. He knew how yeah. to inspire a person to get the best out of them. They always say that you can tell a lot about people by how you communicate and act with like people such as like, like a, a server at a restaurant or customer service people on the phone, yeah. um, like m more modern, you know, talking to people on the phone like that. And it's true when you see people who are mean to a server, it's just like, Oh, exactly. man, that's, it makes you just like you cringe. But Absolutely. when, when people treat them well, and I mean, it's just they're normal people like everyone else just doing a job. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. So moving the ball forward here a little bit. So obviously, so he had a great career. You said he went around the world four times, um, playing all over internationally famous, um, four take five, which maybe we pause. I know we talked about it earlier, but so he, why don't you tell us a little bit of what you know about his setup for take five? Cause there, that album is actually great is 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 entire like out of time is really great um lots of interesting stuff but you know take five is like quote unquote the single did he just use a ride symbol for that i, I know he probably had a hi-hat obviously but wasn't it a very minimal setup i mean there's kind of a there's a cool video out there about that ride but what was his yeah what was the deal with that well you know that ride symbol that ride symbol is uh, on display at the memphis drum that's shop. it that's right and that symbol Joe gave that symbol to the Caputo family. So I mentioned Ralph Caputo earlier in the conversation and how he played accordion and Joe and his family knew Ralph from the time he was very, very young and, and they probably played together and how he knew Hank Garland and that probably was how Joe um, learned of Hank Garland and, and um, became, an, became associated with him. 
And then when Ralph passed, his son Greg had the symbol. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and he, Greg's a drummer. Greg had the symbol. I believe Greg's a drummer. Greg had the symbol. And uh, so it was, it, was in, uh, it was in the family. He inherited it. And uh, there's some pictures from that session, what I believe to be from that session, in, at Columbia Records. And um, all the pictures that I could see, there was just one symbol. It was a 20-inch A Zildjian medium ride and then a nice. pair of hi-hats. He also used a nine by 13, um, small Tom, uh, a 16 by 16 inch floor Tom, um, a 14 by 22 inch bass drum and a five inch by 14 inch snare drum. All Ludwig, super sensitive, right? Super sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. Big Ludwig. And, guy. and, um, and a wooden, a wooden beater on the Speed King bass drum pedal with a okay. moleskin patch on the batter side to get that thwack that he got. He was known for that yeah. thwack bass drum sound that he would get. Yeah. Um, so the sizes, the drum sizes were more, you know, akin of what a big band drummer perhaps would use. Um, sure. At that time, most most jazz drummers were using a 20 inch bass drum or even an 18 inch bass drum mm -hmm. in the late 1950s, uh, an eight by 12, a 14 by 14 small time, usually two symbols. I mean, I've seen set up live with him where he was using two symbols or even three, two crashes and a, and a ride. He helped popularize the odd sizes in symbol making. He was mm -hmm. one of the first to, uh, suggest to, uh, the Zildjian company to make odd sizes, a 21 inch ride, a 19 inch crash ride, a 17 inch crash and 13 inch hi-hats. Before that, everything was even sized, 20, yeah. 18, 16. Um, and so, um, because that was sort of his identity or his brand, right? Odd time signatures. So he liked the <laughs> odd size symbols. He played, he played a 21 That's funny. later. That makes sense. Wow. Um, but on that, yeah. on that particular session, he was using a 20, but he got all different sounds, different qualities of sounds from the symbol itself. Play near the edge. He played near the cup. He played it with sticks. Hmm. He played it with brushes. Yeah. You said it before a master of, of sound and touch really and touch, but really more than like, like not just a, um, you know, let a tech set up your drums and kind of, uh, just come in, sit down and play. But he, he really just embodies just the drums in general you know just the the beauty and the the mastery of of the drum set from from uh from top to bottom um yeah he you know he truly enjoyed playing i mean he loved playing he never practiced on a set of drums he told me oh really so because he always lived in an apartment so he never he never sat down behind the drums and actually worked out any of those odd time signature grooves or or um, beats or polyrhythms. You know, he's known for the table of time where he can play triplets with, you know, his left hand and seven with his right foot and five with his right hand and superimpose yeah. different groupings of notes simultaneously. He's known for that. I've seen him do that in clinics many times. And, um, but he never practiced on the drums. He always practiced on the pad. He never worked. Which, which is astounding, really, when you think about it, because most drummers today, that's what they do. I mean, they don't even start on a snare drum. Most students, they, they get a drum set, and they start on the drum set. And that was really the core thread of Lessons with Joe. He would, he would say, why don't we start with trying to create one even and consistent sound? Let's get an even and consistent sound on one surface before we confuse things and try yeah. to create a, even and consistent sound on multiple surfaces. Because really the drum set, as Max Roach once said, is a multiple percussion instrument. Of course. So yeah. if, you, if you're unable to get an even and consistent sound on one surface, how are you going to get an even and consistent sound on five, six surfaces when you include the cymbals? It's impossible. You know, on, in my, the, the couple lessons I've had with Barry James, who was, who, who maybe at the end I can talk about it more. He, he, he co-wrote a book with Joe that was about their lessons with stone, but 
he showed me how he's like, close your eyes. And we all know this kind of thing where like, you should be able to, he should be doing doubles left, right. And you should not have any idea which hand he's using. You shouldn't hear a, you shouldn't hear a difference. Right. And it seems like exactly like what you're saying, where it just comes back to um, a clean, consistent sound. Go from there, you know, which um, should sound like you're playing everything with one hand. So when you play exactly. the first three pages of the stone book, even though there's 72 single B combinations starting on page five, it should sound if you close your eyes, it should sound like you're playing them all with your right or left hand. There shouldn't be any deviation in sound. Yeah. And as you say that, I, I meant to mention this before the, the missing, uh, page eight, the missing fourth page, I guess, of, uh, of the, the single beat, um, exercises is in that, uh, book that, Barry that and, right? uh, Joe wrote. So yeah, it's, wow. it's just more, more of more that. stickings, more stickings. You thought you thought you were done. Wow. You're just getting started. Um, wow. when, all right. So he's out of, so 67, let's just push forward here. So 67, sure. he's, he's out of, um, the Brubeck group was, was that a, uh, a rough breakup or was that sort of a, who initiated that end? Um, I would imagine it was probably Dave, but I think it was a collective decision really. I mean, yeah. In, in conversations with Joe, um, he, he just said, we all grew tired of, of traveling so much. Oh yeah, sure. Um, you know, 12 years, 12 and a half years or whatever it was being gone nine months a year. And then yeah. the other three months out of the year, Joe was doing clinics for the Ludwig drum company. Oh. So for most of the time he was gone, he wasn't even, he was never really home for those, for those years. He was always traveling, whether it was with Dave or representing Ludwig doing drum clinics and master classes. So because the Brubeck Quartet was one of the first groups to perform on college campuses. They have mm. a record called Jazz Goes to College, which was done at Oberlin in, in Ohio. That's and, cool. and so Dave's wife was instrumental in booking, um, booking the band at, um, at universities and colleges across the U.S., and so they would come in, they would play, but oftentimes Joe would do classes also during the afternoon. And he helped standardize the master class clinic format that we enjoy today. Yeah. Um, and so he really, in 1967, once the group broke up, he was 39 years old. Hmm. Still very, very young. Yeah. But he, he had enough. He said, I, you know, he said, I, I've done it. He said, I've been around the world four times. He said, we were the first group to play be behind the Iron Curtain, Russia. Um, oh, no. you know, they, um, they played in, in Iraq, Afghanistan in the fifties on a state department tour. Um, a great record, uh, for your listeners to check out jazz impressions of Eurasia. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful recording. Um, in addition to timeout, of course, um, gone with the wind another incredible recording. You can hear Joe's brushwork on that amazing recording. Um, and, and the Carnegie hall, the live Carnegie hall recording that period is, um, is very, very special. That period of that group. Um, yeah. yeah. I thought his playing changed. That's why it's so interesting to hear, um, those recordings while he was with Marion and when he was freelancing, and recording with other artists before he joined Dave, then he joined Dave. And those first five, six years, um, the first six years, say, of the Brubeck Quartet, um, his, his approach was, was lighter and more, um, more spatial, perhaps. Mm -hmm. His solos were. Um, but as time went on, when, when they finished their run in 66, 67, um, you could see some of that footage. Um, there's a, there's a great, there's a great video, Joe Morello, the great drum solo, I believe it's called, um, 
where they're playing before like 3,000 people in this, this, this huge outdoor arena. Hmm. And I think on that tour, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass opened for them. Oh, cool. It's a great show. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, they were playing big, big venues at the end. I mean, they were a huge, huge band. Huge. Yeah. Uh, the probably, arguably, the most celebrated ensemble in jazz history is certainly during that period of time. I would agree. Yeah. I mean, obviously, Miles Davis has his groups mm -hmm. of, you know, his, his various musicians. But, um, and I'm not saying, I'm not taking away from any uh, of the other great jazz artists that, you no, know, we all listen to and gain inspiration from. But in terms of popularity, they, they were tapped into something. Yeah. That I, and I think it had a lot to do with being on college campuses and playing for the youth of America. That's the next generation styles in the world changed 67 you know right. then you get into you know the summer of love and rock and roll and the 70s i mean the right. beatles are already roaring but like and actually probably coming to close to an end but music was changing and that perhaps could have led to that decision yeah sure to to, to disband where maybe today they might have just taken a little hiatus and, and regrouped um they did do a reunion tour in the mid seventies for the 25th anniversary of the Dave Brubeck Quartet. Oh, cool. And, um, there's a live recording of that on a and records for your listeners that they can go and check out where you can hear that quartet shortly before Paul Desmond passed. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, um, which is really a, sp a special, a special recording because, uh, yeah. I think they were only out for maybe, a few weeks sure they weren't out it's for like a long extended period of time but they were they were traveling in a bus and they were that's cool were playing you know around the u.s on a tour and uh, uh the drum tech um that helped joe with the drums and was a student of joe's his name's steve forrester and um he's he's also a great drummer and and, and has a book out that's that has um a lot of different technical exercises based on sticking different sticking patterns and things he worked on with with Joe that uh, I think would really be of interest to your listeners as well to check yeah. out. Um, but yeah, I mean he um, that whole that whole group is very very special group, and uh, you know I hope that this this time together that we're spending and if people are listening and checking it out that they can go back and revisit. Um, some of those recordings and um and gain inspiration from them yeah beyond and i'm kind of guilty of this where i need to do more listening it's it's fun homework where you beyond take five mm -hmm. you know um i think that's it's a great thing to have that one song that everyone knows that he is just infamous for but beyond that and and look into his 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 catalog obviously with brubeck but with with further back but um I feel like there's so much we could just talk about. Uh, so one side note, I just think is an interesting thing that I've heard from a couple people is, is um, uh, about, and not even drum related, but Joe with his seeing eye dog named Matthew, yeah. I believe. Um, it's just kind of a fun little character um, point about him, him, him having a dog like that. Yeah, I met Matthew, Matthew once. He came to the lesson, one of the first lessons that I took and um he would always be really close with joe um when when gene would drop him off matthew was sitting right next to joe right in the front seat between the two of them uh he would travel with him on airplanes he would sleep in the hotel rooms with him um he was really broken up when when he passed oh yeah uh, well they had to put him down um he had some issues with his hip and um he was in such such pain but and he never got another dog after that hmm. Um, you'll, sometimes you'll see a pennant that Joe in some pictures, you'll see Joe wearing a pennant around his neck with, uh, a, a little picture of, uh, you know, silver pennant with, um, Matthew's face. God, the dogs are the greatest thing in the world, but it's the saddest thing in the world. Like they, they don't live forever. We all know this, but it's just, especially that connection between a seeing eye dog and someone is just that's like heartbreaking 
<laughs> to think about that. You, you might also find of interest too. Your listeners might, if we have a minute. Yeah, we talked about how he standardized and popularized the drum set clinic and masterclass format. He was also he also recommended the Bill Ludwig, Bill Ludwig the second, to add his name on the front resonant head of the bass drum, because before that, drums didn't have the company logo on the front. Hmm. So Joe was, oh, was Joe smart. was the first to say, you know, when we do these drum clinics and I'm going out with Dave, why don't you put Ludwig right there under the, right in the front, right on the front bass drum head, right under the hoop. He recommended that. He was also the first drummer to use sparkle finished drums. Oh, cool. When he was in Chicago with Marion McPartland, they opened in Chicago in 1953 with that trio. And Bill Ludwig came out on the second night that they were there at the Blue Note to hear Joe play. And Joe had this old WFL white marine pearl drum set with a really squeaky Speed King pedal. And uh, he was having difficulty. The thing was like falling apart. He was putting it on the on the hoop of the, of the bass drum. And um, Bill Ludwig saw him setting this up. And he said, hey, uh, Joe, uh, you look like you're having some difficulty with that bass drum. Um, can I help you? He goes, hi, my name is Bill Ludwig. And wow, Joe was surprised that he was there and was happy to meet him. And he offered to take him to the WFL factory um, in 1953 to take him over to give him a tour of the factory. And when he did the next day, he noticed some sparkle finished drums that were on shelves in the factory that were going to be used for marching drums because any sparkle finished drums in the 50s were, were given to marching bands to use. That was the sp mm. a specific finish for that. And uh, Joe, it just caught his eye, the sparkles, just caught his eye. And he asked if um, he could get a drum set made with the silver sparkle finish. And that silver sparkle finish had some crushed glass in it. Those early sparkle finishes had, were actually made with crushed glass. Gotcha. and um so cool so he was you know and today that's such a standard finish that yeah a lot of jazz drummers use yeah um but yeah he he um he did a lot for the industry and he did a lot for jazz drummers did a lot for jazz drum education music education um he did a lot for humanity really um, he did yeah i i, I don't I don't know anyone that studied with him that still doesn't feel this closeness and how, whether it was one lesson or years of lessons, how that time together completely changed the trajectory and relationship that you had with the instrument. And he did it through example. Because he'd always yeah. say, if I can do it, you can do it. Sure. That's smart. And it's very, very true. I mean, what yeah. he overcame in his life from the over 30 operations on his eyes to moving to New York. Most people are scared, you know, obviously scared to move to New York and try to make a living at music. But to do it where you can't really see, you can't get around, you can't drive, you can't schlep mm. your drums, you can't do any of those things. God, you know, I a, mean, yeah. And so yeah, courageous I, I, for me. And I know other students, you know, that have studied with him and are incredible drummers that we mentioned throughout the podcast. You know, we feel like this, there's this bond that we have and, and we love to talk about Joe and it makes us feel better. And we feel like we're, we're, we're torch bearers in 2010, the summer before he died. I called him and, um, I said, Joe, um, I'm going to be in town and I would love to get together. And I have my son with me and my son is, uh, he's 24 now, but, uh, and he was touring with the Glenn Miller orchestra until COVID hit and uh, great drummer. And, um, I said, you know, my, I'd like for you to meet my son and maybe give him a lesson. Well, I didn't know by that time that Joe had retired from teaching altogether. Hmm. And so he said, yeah, I would love to see you again. I'd love to meet your son. He came in to Glenn Weber's and Glenn Weber taught his Joe studio. Glenn Weber's was up a flight of steps. And so Joe walked up that flight of steps 
um, even though he wasn't feeling well, he was really experiencing some bad back pain. Went in, gave my son an hour lesson, didn't take a cent. Oh, that was cool. the last lesson Joe taught. Oh. Which I'm so grateful that he did that and he shared that experience with him. And at his first lesson, he said to my son, he said, do you have any questions? And my son was very nervous, of course. And yeah. he couldn't really think of any questions at the time. And he said, well, I'll impart some wisdom. This is a very, very long career that you're about to embark on. And if you want to have a life in music, the best thing that I can say to you is that you really got to love it. You really yeah. have to be dedicated and you really, really have to love it. If you're doing it for any other reason, then you might want to consider another profession. Hmm. At my first lesson, he said, Steve, I'm 40 years older than you. The music that you're into, I'm probably not. And the music I'm into, you're probably not into. So what <laughs> I'm about to show you, trust me, what yeah. I'm about to show you will help you play in any style of music that you see yourself playing. Hmm. And uh, so true. Yeah. So it, again, it, it was, um, he was like a, he was like a, a, a second father to me. Hmm. What's your son's name? Tony. Tony. Does Tony yeah. still play the drums? Oh yeah. You know, like I said, he was on the road with the Glenn Miller band. Oh yeah. He That's was studying funny. with wow. Danny Gottlieb at the university of North Florida, finishing up his music education degree there. He was on the road with the Miller band until this hit. And now, um, like all of us, we're, we're sort of in a holding pattern until yeah. we know what the next steps are in, uh, in our career here in terms of moving forward musically as musicians here. Sure. Wow. How long did you take lessons? So you took lessons from 1987. When did, when did you, I took a two hour lesson every two weeks for four years. And then when I joined the military, I was I was at University of North Texas working on my, my master's degree. I was a teaching assistant in the percussion department there. And then I joined the Army Field Band, which we talked about earlier. And, um, and Joe was the one who told me about that job. He saw the listing in the International Musician paper. Hmm. And um, cool. he suggested, why don't, you take that, why don't you take the audition? He said, you don't have to take the gig. Take the audition. He said, if you yeah. win the gig, then you have the choice. But... To prepare for that gig, you're going to learn a lot about yourself and a lot about that music that that band is uh, is performing. So I took the audition and I and I won that job. And um, so I was stationed in Washington D.C. and um, I would go up once a month or so, maybe once every six weeks for checkups for like the next ten years. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, just to see him and and to make sure that everything that I was working on was anatomically correct because he was all about all about the sound that you were producing making sure that you weren't doing anything nonsensical that you were accepting the rebound he wanted to hear the tone of the stick when the drum stick struck the drum pad he wanted your reflex action to be very very quick um sure and so and i didn't want to develop any bad habits so it was always good for me to go up and have a check-in and uh and see him and, you know, he was, um, he was always a, a major resource for me in terms of direction and inspiration. And he always had the countless, countless exercises. It was always changing and always developing. And it was generational. If you talk to students that studied with him in the 50s, it was a little different than the students in the 60s, a little different than the students that studied with him in the 70s. There was a lot of, a lot of the same exercises but there were different exercises. He was constantly adding and changing his yeah, repertoire like stone. of exercise. Yeah, that's what I've heard about Stone. Um, so he passed away in 2011. So he lived to be 83 years old, which is just a very long and 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 obviously yeah, just shy. Fruitful. His birthday was in okay. July, so he was at, he was 82. 82. Wow. Yeah. Was it just? I assume it was natural causes. I mean, he was just he, you know, that's a pretty long life. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, wow. 
Unbelievable. I want to save some time here at the end to talk, talk about you and tell people where they can find you and all that stuff. Um, are we missing anything about Joe? I feel like we have a pretty good, is it safe to assume from 67 up until, you know, maybe the end of when you said he retired from teaching, um, Mm -hmm. that he just maintained performing and was still doing clinics and teaching and just stayed, you know, as far as I understand, he was still very heavily, uh, in the limelight of the drum world uh, for a long time, right? Yeah, I mean, starting in six, late 67, I think the last gig the band did, the Dave Brubeck Quartet did, was December 26th, 1967. They did a concert in Pittsburgh, which was recorded. And that is uh, that recording's on Columbia. And that's called Their Last Time Out. For anyone that wants to you know, hear that, yeah. and, and get a, a sense of the timeline and the breadth of, of information and music that that, that group performed. But um, yeah, starting in, in 68, he, he essentially became full-time uh, teaching, and he would teach in a drum shop, you know, very very blue-collar existence. You know, he would go in, yeah. teach at, at the drum shop. He would have student after student after student, and then he would go, go home, you know, um, and I'm sure from talking with other students that he had throughout the 70s, uh, it was a very similar experience with, you know, running late. Some students didn't like it. They didn't come back. <laughs> you know, some sure. students that were traveling from very long distances, uh, some from overseas, you know, they would oh, miss boy. connections. Um, but, you know, it's not like today where you could do a FaceTime lesson or a Skype lesson or a Zoom call. Um, everything yeah. had to be done in person and, and he knew what he had was, was different and special. And he, he wanted you to prove to him that you really wanted it. Yeah, sure. You know, and so it was sort of on his terms, but he was always very, very giving of his time. You know, he believed strongly in self-improvement and developing your own individual style of playing. He would always say, why do you want to play like this drummer or why do you want to play or sound like that drummer that's already been done yeah we all have our own special god-given talents that we should explore and develop it would be very boring if everyone played the same yeah that was the point he was trying to make sure definitely um smart guy yeah amazing amazing person um some of the recordings that he was making while with marrying with partland there's There's two recordings that he did that I have anyway. There's probably more, but the the two I have with Marion, Marion McPartland at Storyville and at the Hickory House and Timeless Marion McPartland. So if you wanted to listen to some recordings of of Joe uh, before Brubeck, during Brubeck, his first solo recording that he did on RCA, which is very hard to find, with Sextet and Big Band is it's called it's about time Hmm. um features a very young gary burton on vibraphone and phil woods on alto that's a that's an excellent recording um geez we we could talk for hours you know about (laughs) about joe um yeah but i think we have a a very good understanding of him as a person him as a musician coming up and getting you know really it's a success story yeah. The hardships with his vision and, you know, how he had to deal with that and the 30 surgeries, your lessons with him, which obviously for those four years, it really grew into a, you know, a, a lifelong friendship for the rest of Joe's life. Um, and you became yourself quite the successful, um, you know, performer and drummer, educator, composer. Um, and so you have a recent album out, which I think would be great to uh, kind of tell people where they can hear you. So Battle Lines is your your latest album, which is just phenomenal. Thank um, you. And so I, I actually and let's give let's give him a, a shout out. So Neil Goldenthal oh, was yeah. the person who's a student of yours, right. correct? Who at who, Temple, who, at Temple, at Temple yeah. who reached out and said, hey. I think you should talk to Steve about uh, Joe Morello, and I think it would just be a great show. And I mean, it's just funny because that was probably a year ago. And these, uh, it's probably me just doing kind of this whole thing alone here. It takes forever to actually get things moving. 
but uh, but here we are. So yeah, big th thank you. Thankfully, Neil. we were able to get together and, and do this, and and I'm and I'm honored because um, to be a part of it and and to speak on behalf of my experience with Joe. If you had other drummers on that studied with him, you would have similar, probably similar a similar conversation, but also different experiences um, as well. And and they're all valid. Yeah. And that and that was the thing about Joe. He believed that to his core, that all music and all people, everything in life, if it's done with integrity, is valid. And that mm -hmm. you have to respect that. And so I appreciate you reaching out to me and uh, oh through, gosh, through yeah. Neil and, and, um, and giving me this platform to speak about my experiences with Joe. Um, there are so many, so many great, great drummers that you could have had on. And, uh, oh, and, and yeah, if you have perfect. time to do that, I mean, you, you may want to, uh, investigate their experiences too, because, um, with Joe, because it's so, um, they don't teach drums that way anymore. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, they just don't No, it's a different. And I've, I've learned that with my, my lessons with Barry mm -hmm. James is it's, it's a different level of apprenticeship ness, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's a different level of, uh, you know, not just, all right, you're clock in for your half hour and then you're out. Um, so it's cool to hear these stories and, uh, and, and I'm sure it is out there where you get, you know, teachers who are very, you know, hands-on and all that stuff. But, um, but yeah, so it's just really cool to, to, to look at, you know, Joe was a legendary teacher and performer and I plan on doing more of these biographies and spotlights on, you know, like Max Roach, right. Papa Joe Jones, all these guys. Um, so it's important to keep their, their name in the forefront and for younger generations to check yeah. out their work. It really Definitely. is really, really important. So um, let's tell people they can find you at Steve Fiddick. So it's S-T-E-V-E-F-I-D-Y-K-F-I-D-Y-K.com. So Steve Fiddick .com. Mm -hmm. Um, You're on social media. You're on all that stuff. So people can uh, dig into your discography. I'm sure if they search you on Spotify or Apple Music, I think I find you on Spotify. It's just easy to you know click and listen and, and hear what uh, Steve's all about and what his uh, lessons with Joe produced yeah, to, to this, this day this particular recording bart um if your listeners are interested in purchasing a physical copy they can go to blue canteen music which is a new record label that i started oh, cool. earlier this year blue canteen music.com and if they purchase a physical copy um, i'm donating a portion of the proceeds to warrior beat and nice. warrior beat is a organization that helps enrich the lives of military veterans suffering with PTS and anxiety through oh, that's great. hand drumming. So, wow. um, this organization, warriorbeat.org, if they can, your listeners can go check out, um, their mission at warriorbeat.org. Uh, this group purchases hand drums and they hand out hand drums to, uh, military veterans. And, and it's a, it's a, it's a form of music therapy for these, for these men and women. And, uh, yeah. Now this wouldn't be on streams. It would be on physical, physical copies sold. Of so course, if they go to Blue course, Canteen Music and, and purchase a copy of the new record and it's charting on Jazz Week. It's doing well. It's getting some nice hey. reviews. So I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm grateful for that. Um, appreciative of that. Um, seven original compositions of mine and um, actually one Brubeck tune that they recorded um, on a trip in 1958 when they were in Poland. And... Um, and so that's on on this recording as well. So if uh, if your if your listeners are so inclined, if they want to check it out, um, they can go to bluecanteenmusic.com. And thank you for the plug. Oh yeah, no, I think everyone should go listen and uh, and support and buy a physical copy to help with the uh, Warrior Beat um, kind of uh, collaboration there. So that's God, that's cool. Thanks. Um, Awesome, Steve. Well, I think uh, this is a, a deep dive into Joe Morello, and I, I feel pretty confident that we we covered it and, yep. and drove home that this, you know, he's he is an absolute integral part of drum history. So, um, Steve, thank you for being on the show, and I look forward to hearing what you keep doing in the future and uh, and all that good stuff. Thanks again for having me, Bart. I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak to your listeners. May God bless. <laughs> 
If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast. <laughs>